it's always difficult going second. Uh, you're going to see a lot of similarities uh, with what uh, Monul just showed you guys, which also proves uh, smart people think alike, so that's great. <laughs> um, all right. Good morning and welcome to Flame Forward 2017. This is pretty exciting. I'm Chinmay Soman. I'm delighted to be part of the first US chapter of this conference. Today, I'm going to be talking about, again, the ever exciting space of uh, near real time analytics and how this is relevant to Flink and you know, even fundamental to this conference. This is, of course, a perspective from Uber. And I'm happy to share some of our stories and what we've been up to in the, in the last few years. Just to add a little bit more color to what Jamie said, um, hang on, let me. Sorry about that. All right, so um, I'm, the, I'm the tech lead of the streaming platform team, and this team is responsible for building the real-time messaging infrastructure that connects different parts of our ecosystem together. And this team also provides an infrastructure platform similar to, again, Netflix, that helps our customers analyze these streams at scale. So our messaging ecosystem is built around Apache Kafka, and we're one of the biggest users in the industry. As of today, uh, we, we get roughly hundreds of billions to trillions of messages per day, which account for petabytes of data. Uh, legal has told me to be especially vague here. So. Um, and, and keep in mind, this, is, this does not include any backups or aggregations done downstream. This is the raw data coming into the system. Our analytical infra is, is no, that's a lot. As analytical infra is slowly, uh, is, is slowly and steadily catching up to this scale. Uh, as of today, our, just our stream processing and analytical infra processes roughly hundreds of terabytes to petabytes of, of data per day. Right, so before I, I jump in uh, into the talk, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page when I say what is near real time. So in this chart, if the timeline denotes amount of time taken to process your data or make a decision from the time that the corresponding messages were first created into the system. So in typical online systems, this is roughly in the order of milliseconds, uh, and, and the data is mostly sitting in main memory or RAM. Whereas in traditional batch systems like Hadoop, this can be anywhere between minutes to several hours. The Problem space we focus on deals with a time range of seconds to under five minutes. And this is, this is uh, the use cases I, I'll go over will make this more concrete. Okay, so in this talk, I'll, I'll walk you guys through uh, how our business needs have evolved through these years and how the infrastructure team has always been trying to play a catch up game. And, and we still are to a certain extent. I'll also talk about how we use SQL as the building block in, in the new ecosystem that we are building today with Apache Flink at its core. And as is expected in any talk, I'll go over the future work. Okay, so let, let's jump right in. Um, our very first business need uh, in, in Uber was to understand our growth metrics. So Uber, as you know, is a global company. Uh, we operate in more than 500 cities. So every time we enter a new city, we depend on a local city team to bootstrap the market for Uber and also to make sure it's healthy. So, to make, so for these teams to function effectively, they have to answer questions like, how many drivers are active right now? Or what percent of trips have been delayed uh, in the last five minutes? And, and this can actually get pretty granular. Um, for example, you might want to know what percent of UberX trips have been happening in this city for all Android users, and, and so on. So one way to compute these metrics is to look at all this data sitting in Kafka. So for example, 
every time you request a trip on Uber, that event is, is logged to Kafka. Or when you're in an ongoing trip, you're, you're getting, we're getting these regular updates of geolocations that's also getting logged to Kafka. So the earliest system that we built around this, is, it was called Artemis. Uh, this was back in late 2013, early 2014, even before our team officially existed. And the idea was quite simple. Uh, we used Apache Storm, which is a stream processing engine, to take all these events sitting in Kafka and categorize them by time into different buckets of, say, five minutes. So for each such bucket, we compute an aggregate value. So for example, count of trips, or, or the sum of earnings of all the trips falling in that bucket. And then you can store all these aggregates values in, in a database for further processing. So now, if I want to get, let's say, count of trips in the last five minutes, or one hour, or one day, all I need to do is find the right time buckets and, and add those values up. And furthermore, you can plot this on a dashboard and give this dashboard to the city teams, and, and they love this. They're addicted to this. <clears throat> okay, so this is actually a fairly common pattern that's used in by used many companies even today, because at a very high level, this is this looks really simple. Right? There's not many things going on. So what could possibly go wrong? Intentional pause. All right. <laughs> well, it turns out pretty much everything. Uh, uh, for, to begin with, you can get delayed events because your upstream application goofed up and they're emitting events using an incorrect timestamp. So these events actually now go to a different bucket and your metrics are incorrect. You can also get duplicate events in Kafka, which are rare, but they can happen because Kafka is at least once, at least at that time. Um, so you can imagine what happens next. These duplicate events go to the same bucket and you're now double counting your metrics and you, you feel happy about your metrics for a little bit. Um, or you can get events that are just plain wrong because the upstream decided to emit data in raw JSON and in some cases, the pipeline does not know what to do with that. So remember, kids always use schemas. It's very important. <clears throat> so we, we can't always blame the upstream for problems. There's actually issues in the pipeline itself. Um, Apache Storm, at that time, I don't want to start a flame war. <laughs> at that time, it suffered from the inability to, uh, to recover from back pressure. And, and back pressure is when one of the components in your pipeline slows down. For example, it's slow in talking to a database, or it's going through a GC pause, or it's getting too much data. There's a, there's a big skew. And whenever this happens, the entire pipeline starts slowing down, and it goes into a degraded state. For us, this was actually a pretty severe problem. Uh, in our case, Storm took several hours to recover. And in some cases, it didn't recover at all. And we had to, we actually started losing data because Kafka started doing its retention. And, and so we just gave up and reset the pipeline, leading to data loss. So what do you, what do, you do here? As, as I think Srikant <laughs> mentioned before, he, only, he stole my thunder a little bit. Uh, we did what everybody else did, which is to use a backfill pipeline. Or, as Rikan mentioned, this is commonly known as a Lambda architecture. Again, to those who don't know what this is, uh, Lambda is a thing that causes a lot of pain and suffering <laughs> amongst engineers. And it wipes out any notion of weekends or social life <laughs> as well. Uh, so thank you for stealing my thunder, but it is true. Uh, what, you, what you end up doing is basically repeat the same computation on a different source, such as a data lake or, or Hadoop, more commonly. And the assumption here is the data lake is a source of truth. Right? So you maintain your correctness on, on that data lake. 
But what this means is now you're maintaining a custom pipeline alongside your primary pipelines. And you may have to make sure these two are always in sync. The code has to give you the same correctness guarantees. So typically this is a huge overhead and, and you routinely cannot do this in a timely manner. Usually backfills are 12 hours delayed or, or more. There's one more problem that I want to bring up here, which is not really infrastructure related. So remember, count of trips is just one dimension. But count of trips for a given city for Android users is yet another. So as our business grows, these, these dimensions are going to go grow exponentially. And we get what is known as uh, data explosion or write amplification. So in other words, for every stream of data coming in, we are now storing multiple aggregate values across di different dimensions. And this has some cost implications, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, so, so the team at that time uh, evolved Artemis into a new product called as Apollo. Uh, and, and the idea was to get rid of the stream processing pipeline entirely, and instead just dump the raw events into a database. So in this case, we chose MemSQL, which is a fast in-memory transactional database. And on top of MemSQL, we also built some intelligent caching, which, which takes into account your, your timestamps, and also a new time series query language to build even better dashboards. So effectively, what you've done here is move the overhead from ingestion or stream processing into query processing. Because now, every time you run a query, it has to do all those aggregations on the fly which means your database has to be powerful enough, and, and this is one of the reasons for choosing MemSQL. So overall, the system is fast. It's also accurate, because let's say you know, so delayed events automatically get corrected, since you're storing, it's like a snapshot of those events in MemSQL. And if you have corrupted events, you can just replay the correct versions, and that also gets automatically corrected. So you can actually, in a way, do your backfill in, 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 in a timely fashion, instead of 12 hours. And the system is scalable. You can just keep adding more nodes to your, to your MemSQL cluster. But one thing we should talk about here is cost. Because in theory, you're storing uh, all, these, all this data in your main memory. So this, this it seems expensive. What's, what's the catch? So remember the data explosion I just spoke about? Uh, it, it turns out that if we had continued using Artemis in the long run, we would have actually spent more on, on regular storage, uh, spinning disks, than what we, what, what we will end up spending uh, on the MemSQL cluster. So in the long run, this approach actually becomes cost efficient. And, and again, just to clarify, this is because we are avoiding the right, right amplification here. Okay, so over time, people wanted to do more with the data sitting in Kafka uh, to do things like real-time fraud detection. So for example, this is actually a production use case today. Uh, the fraud team wanted to monitor in real time the number of signups happening on Uber. So you can sign up as a rider or a driver partner. And they wanted to track the number of signups uh, per device ID, so your, your phone or your laptop. And if you get more signups per ID, that's more likely that's a bot, and then we can ban it, ban it from the system. Uh, let's take another example of, uh, so Uber has this program called vehicle leasing, where we lease out cars to driver partners who cannot afford them, uh, especially true in, in growing economies. Uh, and so obviously we want to know if somebody just takes off in this in this in such a leased car. So to be specific, the requirement here is, let's say we have a predetermined geofence that covers certain sections of the city. We want to know if the geolocation coming from the car or from the phone actually falls outside of this this geometry. And in, if that happens, immediately send an alert. So these two are some of the many, many use cases we started getting 
uh, and we decided to build a platform around this, again, similar to what Netflix has done. Um, oh, actually, let me, let me give you, yeah, sorry. So the, so the platform is called Athena, uh, and it's built on top of Apache Samza, which is a stream processing framework. Uh, Samza gives you a lot of benefits, such as it's, it's known to be robust in production. We've been actually using this for two years. It is easy to operate and maintain. It does not suffer from any back pressure issues, what we saw earlier. And, and it does come with a built-in state management, which is actually pretty useful. You can do things like join two different streams together or maintain windowed aggregates in, in the stream processing itself. So let me give you a concrete example. Let's, let's go back to the fraud use case I, I mentioned before. So here, a user can come into the system and write a custom SAMSA code that tracks number of signups by device ID. And we can use the built-in state management for, for keeping track of this. And at any point of time, um, if this number is beyond some threshold, then we can call RPC to ban the, ban the user. And again, uh, we, the, the, all the user does is write a one, one file of code, and they get monitoring, deployment, and scalability out of the box. Today, we, are, we also support active-active across multiple data centers and then things like failovers, so, so they don't have to worry about that. Okay, so over time, again, now that people could manipulate streams in real time, they wanted to do more with it or, or do some ad hoc data exploration on top, also known as online analytical processing. So for example, like many other companies, we are running our A-B tests throughout the day. In fact, every, every second. And let's say that I want to monitor the progress of these tests as they are happening. So here, standard metrics, like, like we saw earlier, don't really help because no one stream of Kafka gives me all the information that I want. So I need to be able to combine streams coming from the driver side and the rider side and combine them before I can analyze it. Or let's say you want to do behavioral analysis and we want to, for example, see how many first time riders, or first time riders on Uber are dropped off in a geofence like an airport. And again, one Kafka stream is not enough because even though you get geolocations, you don't know if they are first time riders or not. So if you think about it, this is really a combination of the first two use cases we saw earlier. And naturally what we did is integrate these technologies in our platform. So the stream processing framework is used to do things like filter out interesting events and reduce noise, uh, merge different streams together before you can analyze them. And in some cases, you decorate uh, Kafka events with additional information which is obtained from an external database. And now this derived data can be um, can be dumped into another database. And different teams in Uber have historically used different technologies. So I already spoke about MemSQL, but Elasticsearch is also pretty popular, as we saw on Netflix as well. Uh, in Uber, Athena platform natively supports Pinot, which is an OLAP database coming out of LinkedIn as well. And today, Pinot powers a lot of our critical dashboards, like experimentation platform. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Um, we started the journey with Artemis, uh, which was evolved to become Apollo. And, and Apollo gives us accurate metrics for our, for our growth. We started building Athena for doing complex event processing, uh, where people can build ad hoc pipelines. And we also merged uh, and integrated with OLAP as well. So are we done? Well, given I haven't even mentioned Flink, obviously not. Uh, <laughs> so what's missing from this picture, right? Well, to begin with, this platform is actually difficult to use by non-engineers. Uh, uh, for example, data scientists who may or may not be from an engineering background, or operations people like the local city teams who, who, want, who need to influence the riders and the driver partners. In addition, 
code reusability is actually pretty poor. We have seen different teams implement the same use case again and again and again in different, uh, in different code repositories. And again, we haven't really gotten rid of the custom backfill pipeline. We've made it a little bit better, but it's still there. Backfill is a reality of life that's not gonna go away anytime soon. So at this point, we stepped back and tried to think, attack the problem from another angle, which is SQL. So we went back and looked at all of our production use cases and, and observed that almost 80% of them can actually be expressed as a SQL query. And this includes joins, uh, filtering, windowed aggregations, and in some cases, user-defined functions. So why is this important? Uh, well, because SQL is really flexible and it gives you a powerful abstraction to build really, really complicated use cases. And the underlying assumption is SQL is easier to learn and, 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 and understand than any coding language. So let's take a complicated use case, uh, which is promotions. So Uber, again, like many companies, uses promotions for re retaining its users. But promotions is actually intensely complicated. You need to you know, spend enough to make, make the promotions useful, but you need to be fine-grained enough to target the right audience. There's like a fine balance that you need to do. So let's take a concrete example. Let's say we want to give a bonus of $500 to all driver partners in San Francisco, but only if they take more than 100 trips, each trip costing more than 10 bucks between Friday 5 p.m. And, and Sunday 9 p.m. So today, you can actually write a piece of code that makes this happen in Athena, right? But what if I tell you the rules start getting extremely complicated? So if the number of hours online is more than 10, or weekly earnings is more than 700, or if you just drive over a geofence like 10 times in a row, then you, then you get a bonus. So imagine writing code to handle all such ad hoc use cases because, because these rules keep changing all the time as data scientists find, uh, find new observations. The engineer that has to write this will probably quit if you have to give them a new rule every five minutes. So what if you can use SQL here? So the previous example just becomes a SQL query. For example, select count of trips where the city is San Francisco, the individual fare of that trip is more than $10, and the request at time is between the time range that you want. And if the value of this query is more than 100, then you can trigger some RPC call to make, to make the payment. Now, this, is, this gives you a lot of flexibility because imagine if you can predict rules for individual users, I'm sorry. Uh, so your machine learning, uh, you can have machine learning models that can actually decide what rules make sense per user because every user's motivation is different. So with this model, you can actually generate these rules on the fly and express them easily as, as a SQL query and in, in, into the system. In addition, you can do other things like intelligent alerts using the same model. You can have a select query uh, which looks for the geolocation and uses a user-defined function to check if it's within a geometry, like a Google's S2 bucket, for example. Okay, so we're using this as a building block in our new ecosystem called Athena X. Not that great a naming. Uh, and at its very core is Apache Flink. And we chose Flink for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's actually more reasons than that, but this is what is most important for us. Uh, first and foremost, there's a lot of activity uh, going on in the community related to Apache Calcite integration. And Apache Calcite is the one that defines the grammar of, of streaming SQL. In addition, in our benchmarking, we've seen it's easy to manage and scale Flink. 
uh, it did not suffer from any back pressure issues and, and we really tried, <laughs> we really tried to break fling based on our experience in, in, in Artemis and, and it stood the test, uh, well, of, of the stress test. Uh, it, it also has a built-in state management, uh, which is pretty useful as we saw. One of the best features is it integrates nicely with HDFS and I'll talk about why this is important. And, and lastly, it's not really dependent on Kafka. It's not tied in to Kafka, which, which Samza is. And, and for example, you don't have to depend on Kafka for scaling out or for maintaining the intermediate state in your pipeline, which I think is a bit lacking in, in Samza. So let's, let's again take a concrete example. Let's say you want to build your promotions pipeline uh, using Athena X and Flink. So in this case, instead of writing any code, the user comes in and writes a SQL, which is entered into the rule store. This SQL is then converted into a Flink job, which takes the input from Kafka and applies the rule on top. So we also use a database to store any output state, because this is the state is going to be cumulative over time. And we also use, a, use the same database for doing deduplication in the pipeline. And, and the way you do it is by managing primary keys across different windows. So, so let's say something went wrong and you want to go back and backfill one week's worth of data. Uh, the nice thing here is you can run the same query directly on HDFS using Flink. So for the end user, nothing really changes. Uh, it's the same query, the interface is still SQL. And, and this is how we imagine backfill can be actually made easier for the users. And you can do all your optimizations here. So at a high level, this is how Athena X looks like. Um, I think some of it, again, looks familiar to what Netflix is doing. Again, smart people. Uh, so the user can choose to ingest from Kafka or, or a database change log or HDFS itself. And then instead of writing code, you just write a SQL query into the rule store. And then choose an action, which can be writing back to Kafka or a database, send an alert or, or monitoring, or, or just invoke some HTTP endpoint. So now with Flink in our arsenal, uh, let me ask the question again, are, are we there yet? And, and at this point, I actually don't know. Uh, there's a lot of open questions to where do we go from here, and I've uh, listed a few of them here. My personal favorite is to beam or not to beam. That's definitely the question, looking at the beam team. So beam, for those who don't know, uh, Apache beam, sorry, is a unified model to express your real time and batch pipelines in a standard way. And the concept is extremely exciting. Who wouldn't want this? But I think some integration work has to be done here uh, for, for it to be a big success, which I'm sure it will at some point. But I don't think we're there yet. At the same time, uh, Hadoop itself is becoming more and more real time, uh, if you notice. So I highly recommend a talk by my colleague, Vinod Chandar uh, from Uber, about Hoodie, which is a real time Hadoop system that we're trying to build in Uber. So the question is, if the decision time on Hadoop becomes in the order of 10 minutes or five minutes, do we really need anything else? Can Hadoop be the be all and end all of, of your near real time analytics? Again, we're not there yet. We'll just have to wait and watch for the development. Uh, furthermore, I think we are just barely scratching the surface of use cases that fall in this domain. And we'd love to do more real-time machine learning, but we're not there yet. Uh, we need to figure out the, how to scale the data and more, more importantly, the compute uh, in, in this scale and how to think about locality in machine learning jobs, which is actually pretty difficult. And lastly, I think Monal also mentioned this, uh, is auto-scaling, right? So as we build better abstractions, it's becoming easier for the end users to use these systems. But then somebody else has to do the dirty work. So it's up to our team in Uber to make sure that the systems are always scaling up, right? 
So in some sense, the system must be self-driving to handle common things such as organic growth in data, intermittent failures, or, or running out of resources uh, and, and catching up uh, and doing things like data correction. So we've had some amount of success uh, with this in Apache Samza. We did build a capacity model where users don't choose how many resources they want. They just tell us what they want and we decide the resources for them and scale it up uh, as, as the data grows. We need to do the same thing with Flink. And I think Flink actually has better abstractions to do this uh, as compared to Samza. All right, so with those open questions, uh, not answers, I conclude. And before, before I finish, I uh, want to remind there is a, another talk uh, from Uber about, we, we actually do, Huawei and Bill will be doing a deep dive into Athena X and how, and how the SQL uh, to job conversion is actually done and the complications thereof. So please, uh, if, if you can make it, please uh, attend at 11.45. All right, so with that, I do conclude. Thank you for, thank you, thanks a lot for having me here.